So first off, there has been a lot of debate about what serverless means, and you're already laughing. Um, can you tell me just your own point of view? We're not going to make you kind of committed to what you say here today, but right now, what is serverless to you? I think serverless more than anything is a mindset. It's an approach to developing software that orients around, uh, that has a focus on business value. So making technology choices in support of creation of business value. And that means that wherever possible, we're using managed services uh, instead of building things ourselves. And what that means uh, for those managed services is we want them to scale transparently, we want them to have minimal operations. We want to be billed for just the amount that we're using. And then out of our compute platforms, we want those same things, which leads to uh, the kind of ephemeral compute like functions as a mm -hmm. service. I have to say, I really love ben answer, Ben's answer mm -hmm. uh, because it's very thoughtful. Um, he's obviously thought about it a lot and I couldn't agree more, right? To me, serverless uh, is a mindset. It's a shift to how you develop software. Um, and it's also a set of attributes that when you apply to a service, you can figure out whether it is serverless or not. So being able to have the granular billing or being able to scale from zero to infinity potentially, mm -hmm. right, is what makes a serverless service to me. And it's so interesting that you mentioned compute because this whole thing kind of started with AWS Lambda. Right, when it came out, it was this amazing ephemeral compute service that ran just for as long as you needed, and you only paid for that compute capacity when you needed to run something. So that was kind of a revolution, I think. It started everything. Yeah, I think um, I think one thing is that I don't think it's a service is serverless or not, right? There's there's not really a dividing line in between them. True. It's sort of how yeah. serverless is it? It's true. Mm -hmm. And Lambda was definitely sort of a a, um, a revolution in the computing side of things. But when we think back to you know, the very first AWS services, S3 and SQS, yeah. there are no servers visible to me. I don't have to provision how much storage I need in S3 or how much throughput I need. It's just there. And there isn't, there isn't a f all the way to the end either. There's no, yeah. you know, AWS Lambda is, I love it, but I'm always looking for ways that they can increase the amount of management, the amount of mm -hmm. uh, things that I don't have to worry about anymore. And kind of related with um, some of the things that I've heard you talk about, Ben, is you have this concept of service full as well that I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about. Sure, I think that's uh, that, you know, we focus on serverless around compute, right? Mm -hmm. Around AWS Lambda. But really in the systems that we build, uh, we want to use as little Lambda as possible because that's, mm -hmm. I own more stuff mm -hmm. because I'm bringing custom compute, custom mm -hmm. code into yeah. the system. And when I can just plug two services together, when I can say, I need you know, a database and an API, and I can get API Gateway talking directly to DynamoDB without a Lambda in between, that's a win. That's one less thing I have to worry about. And so our architectures tend to be service full. Mm -hmm. At iRobot, we use over 30 AWS services in production to deliver our uh, applications that support our connected robots. And Lambda is, you know, and overall, it's where all of our business logic lives. Mm -hmm. But that's an overall small part of the, the entire solution. Yeah, I think it's a great shift in mindset, you know, going to that serviceful architecture, right? It's less about you doing stuff, writing code, maintaining that code. You can focus on what adds value to your business specifically. You can kind of outsource all the, you know, regular things that, you, that we used to do, like authentication or storage of data, right? Who wants to recreate that? All the hard that? things. All the hard things. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it isn't that much fun either I mean, to you recreate. you don't just want to worry about doing your authentication all the time. All yeah. the time. Yeah. I think I might have done it 10 times in my career, but <laughs> I never ever want to do it again. So if Amazon can handle it for me, yes, please. I would rather focus on what really makes my business unique. You know, I want to focus on those features. When I think about what uh, we at iRobot are doing, mm -hmm. Um, it enables us to have been a device company that moved to the cloud without having to learn how to s scale, build scalable elastic cloud systems mm -hmm. because all of the services that we use are scalable and elastic already. Mm -hmm. And so we leapfrog all of that uh, experience that we had and are just now cr able to create uh, the user experiences we want to create and have our developers working on uh, 
directly creating business value rather than solving technology problems that will enable somebody to solve a business problem. Yeah, we actually have a similar story because we went from zero to a platform launch in four weeks, right? And we were only able to do it because we leveraged all of these awesome managed services provided by AWS. We used Lambda. Lambda. We don't have a single server EC2 instance inside, right? And we got that speed, that agility by being able to go fully serverless. So four weeks, wow, we had a platform and then it scaled. Yeah. Incredible, right? You couldn't really achieve that with traditional architectures. In the early days of serverless, uh, having a screenshot of your EC2 console just being empty was kind of a badge of honor. Right. Yeah, yeah, got a lot of applause at conferences, yeah. yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the type of applications that you build and how you build them and where serverless comes into play. So can you tell me a little bit about what is it like with writing a, a Lambda function? Sure. Um, you know, a Lambda function is just really a small mm -hmm. or short piece of code um, that you write. You can bring in libraries, you can bring in dependencies, you zip it up, you deploy it to a platform like AWS Lambda, mm -hmm. and then that platform will run and scale the code for you. It will trigger your code um, when needed um, and kind of manage all the underlying compute infrastructure for you. I think, yeah, once you get into that mind shift, once you mm -hmm. start adopting Lambda, it kind of becomes obvious that this is a great way to build software. Do you have like a go-to set of tools or frameworks that you just, that's your thing? Well, look, you know, there is a bit of choice. Mm -hmm. My personal favorites are Serverless Framework and SAM. Mm -hmm. um, two great frameworks, you know, you can kind of organize, package up your code, deploy, can you tell me a little bit about what testing is like with serverless, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, are there particular processes that you do differently because it's a different architecture? Well, I think there's two kinds of testing, right? There's sort of unit testing and integration testing. Mm -hmm. And unit testing becomes harder because your application, you know, instead of having a call graph within your code, your call graph now becomes your infrastructure graph. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes much harder to test everything together or, or individually when really you're talking about managed services. And I think uh, from my perspective, uh, locally mocking uh, cloud services is sort of a, a fool's errand of sorts that, that can get you started easily and get started for, for developers who are used to that coming from containers and sort of traditional architectures. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you're gonna to wanna to grow beyond services that have available local mocking. At that point, you can only test against the deployed system. I think it's, I think it's valuable to actually start that way, to get used to it and build up the muscle memory around that, build up the, um, the understanding of, of how those kind of processes work. Mm -hmm. And once you're engaged in that, it becomes much more feasible to figure out how to go fast doing that. Now on the unit testing side, I like, uh, I write in Python, mm -hmm. and there's a framework called Placebo that allows you to record and play back SDK calls. And so what I do is then my code for my functions is running locally. Instead of actually contacting any cloud services when it's running the unit test, it's using recorded SDK calls to stub out the calls that it would be making out. Mm -hmm. So that allows me to still have unit tests but of course, they don't. They can't span the full range of, of responses, yeah. and so then the integration tests become more important, right? And and so deploying the system and testing it end to end, which is really, you know, in the end, the thing that that, that, that the goal need. of your yeah. testing is. Um, but it's definitely require. It definitely requires a different mindset from mm -hmm. our traditional architectures, where it was possible to, you know, deploy the entire thing on a laptop. So it's interesting what um, Ben just said, because like, just like Ben, we have integration testing and we have unit testing, right? And we kind of follow a very similar approach. Mm -hmm. But I think this is the, I think probably the one thing we slightly disagree on. <laughs> I still feel that, you know, being able to test locally, being able to run a system locally is conducive to that developer experience, mm -hmm. right? We want to meet developers where they're at and developers are used to it, they right? Are. And being able to um, give them that opportunity to run, to experience 
that code on the on the local machine rather than in a cloud environment is important and it's it, it is really hard to do right it's next to impossible i mean yeah sure you can run a simple lambda function on your machine it'll work it'll work you can mock some calls you can stop things out but there's no way to really recreate that cloud environment locally on your computer right you can't run a whole bunch of other aws services that you'll probably end up kind of integrating into your application and yeah. i think the the notion of yeah. locally running the custom code that you're building is is important right mm -hmm. so against all of those managed services that you're using, your custom code running it from your laptop, I think is valuable, Yeah. right? It's the, you know, all of the services yeah. that I want to use yeah. that, yeah, there isn't a mock for it. Yeah. And then as a developer, I'm forced to choose, well, what I desire, the production architecture that I, that I want, I can't locally test it in the, in the development cycle that I'm used to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I either have to all of a sudden change my development process, mm. or I have to decide to work around it constrained by what I can locally mock. And you don't really want your developers to make those decisions. You want them to be able to choose the right production architecture. Yes. And yeah. so that's where I, I, I tend to want the development process to start unconstrained by what's available locally. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to do what's right for your architecture, right? Yeah. It would be nice if tooling supported that. Um, it doesn't always happen, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like as a developer, I want to build an event-driven pipeline, you know, run it and have a result come out at the end. And I want to do it locally as well. I would like to, right? So, but it's okay that we don't have it. It's, it's quite all right because I think still the efficiency and the agility and kind of the innovation that comes out of serverless mm -hmm at least for me, by far, is kind of way more advantageous than maybe not having that on your local system. Is that true, do you think? That's yeah, I think, yeah, yeah in, in the end, you know, the highest fidelity system is the deployed yeah. system. Mm -hmm. And one of the great yeah. things is you're always using production AWS services. In your dev yeah. account, yeah. you're getting, it's yeah. just all the same services yeah. that are yeah, also here's in. The, here's yeah. the test version of exactly. the services yeah. that you're using. Yeah. And so already you're, you have a leg up on, yeah. on the fidelity. Yeah. Look, my gut feel is that possibly in the future this will be a solved problem as well. I think maybe things will become easier in some way that we cannot foresee right now, <laughs> but there could be maybe a way that AWS will solve this. And I think what that looks like is more making the cloud side faster. Yes. That people like lo local not because it's on their laptop, but because it's fast, right? And, and when they have to deploy, the tools to do proper deployments mm -hmm. are slow because they need to handle all yeah. the cases for production. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing a development deploy, it doesn't have to work as reliably, as robustly. Now, figuring out a way to make that happen so that it's faster and that when you make changes into whatever editor you're using, which has to be fast and responsive, doesn't mean that that editor has to completely exist locally, yeah. right? It could be that you're using the editor um, locally on the machine, but it's changing the code remotely. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's right. I mean, if you can reduce that friction, kind of that time it takes you to write something and then test it, then yeah, that'll, that will solve the problem. It's just that, yeah, it's just we have a little bit of friction now, yeah. like Ben said, having to deploy everything, having to wait for CloudFormation to set everything up, and then maybe something will fail and you have to kind of recover and try again. So if we can make things a little bit simpler, a little bit faster for the dev kind of and staging use cases, mm -hmm. I think that may actually go a long way towards solving some of those problems. Yeah, this is the one place where, you know, it's good that we're testing, we get to develop using the production services but they don't have dev modes mm. <laughs> that could allow us things that, that, might, that might be easier for the dev cycle. Where do you want to see serverless go in your ideal world? Look, uh, mm -hmm. I would love to see kind of serverless become even more commonplace. I want to see it become more understood, mm -hmm. right? I think there's still a lot of work for us to be done as a community to really develop and define some of the serverless architectures. Um, we still have, yeah, I think a bit of work to do there. We need to show people how to actually build a scalable e-commerce application. If you go all serverless, 
you know, how to do big data, yeah. you know, how to do analytics, how to do a whole bunch of things with that serverless approach. So I think we will do a lot of that as a community. I'm sure all the cloud providers will do that as well. Um, but I just want to see kind of more innovation. I want to, I want to see more, however, without kind of completely throwing away the constraints that make serverless what it is, right? I completely agree. I think that serverless architectures require, they're inherently and fundamentally different from traditional architectures mm -hmm. so that you can take advantage of the ability to manage uh, services. So with AWS Lambda, it has to have a timeout on it so that uh, the execution environment can get recycled so that AWS can update the OS and the runtime underneath. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have an indefinitely running uh, container, there's no point at which in that life cycle, AWS can do the updates that they need or manage the things inside that container. And so uh, I think it's important to keep those kind of constraints, those ephemeral compute, the kind of constraints that allow for highly managed services that take operations burden off us. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, and if we can make sure that we're teaching new developers to think in that way, to think in how can I construct my system so that I can own as little technology as possible, so I can better accomplish my business goals, then we're going to enable, we're going to unlock uh, cloud computing for a lot more people because this hard technology problems get solved and provided as a service. Yeah. And so more people who don't need to worry about solving technology problems can come in and solve interesting and new business problems. So we have serverless as the democratization of cloud computing. I think so. I love, I love that. It. I love yeah. that. That's, that's great. Yeah.